by Henson Wiener in the... Okay, here we go! Dice Tower Tonight, episode 56. Thanks, gaming. Ha <laughs> ha! Welcome to Dice Tower Tonight, a video cast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On tonight's show, as Thanksgiving approaches here in the States, we discuss games that are perfect for playing with the family over the holiday. Also, Crystal has a devious challenge for me in the chat. We talk about some recent play sessions, and we answer questions from the audience live. I'm Eric Summerer, and joining me now, the Tigger to my Pooh, Crystal Pisano. I mean, obviously, I know who Tigger and Pooh are, but I'm not... Uh, I'm not quite... Oh, Disney Plus launching this week. Is that it? Maybe. I also just returned from the happiest place on Earth. So I have my, uh, you know, multi-year dose of, of happiness <laughs> and cartoon characters. I, I will admit, I uh, I signed up for the thing that they were offering a couple months ago, where if you had a D23 membership, you could sign up for three years of Disney Plus for $140. Yep. And I went ahead and just did it. And I opened the service last night and started just scrolling through what was available. And like my eyes just kept getting bigger and bigger. And then I found Flight of the Navigator, which is one of my all-time favorite Disney okay. movies. And I... I was like, it took everything in me not to watch Flight of the Navigator at like 10.30 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Flight of the Navigator is is one I think I've seen. Gummy Bears, I've seen a lot of people just jumping into the Gummy Bears series. Also, The Rocketeer seems to be very popular as a I first selection. I haven't seen that selection. since I was very young. The music for The Rocketeer is still one of my favorites. That is some great music. I'm excited to, to dive back into a lot of the things that I watched when I was younger that like I may not have wanted to seek out, but now that it's just kind of there, I'm going to rewatch some of it. Yeah, I have not uh, subscribed to Disney+. Plus. I've been waiting. I know that deal, I guess, came and went, um, and, and it's probably too late to try and get that, but uh, we, we already have so much television that we're not watching. I don't feel like subscribing to a new service that I will also not watch. So I, yeah, I think the thing that somebody else was telling me that I honestly, I, I haven't done the math to figure out whether it would be a better deal, but I believe, and nobody quote me on this, but you can like Hulu and Disney are partnered up and you can pay like a little bit more per month and get Hulu and Disney plus, and maybe even like ESPN. Cause they're also part of the same overarching thing. Yeah. And I, it, whatever the cost was, it I think it was like only twelve ninety nine, and you get multiple of the services. And I was like, that feels pretty much like that feels like a decent deal if you're looking to have all of those. If services. you want all of them, and I, I think I was not interested in the ESPN part of all of that, so it was less of a good deal to only get Hulu and Disney Plus. Anyway, yeah. Well, it is almost Thanksgiving, and I am thankful that you and I get to spend some time together this evening. Yes, indeed. And we're actually talking, uh, might as well jump right to the end, about what we're doing in two weeks, uh, which will be the uh, day before Thanksgiving. And you, Crystal, are going to be traveling. So it looks like right now we're going to try and do a slightly earlier stream, talking about maybe 7.30 Eastern Time, uh, and maybe a slightly shorter stream, but still get one in so that we can hang out and, and have some fun before we break for Turkey Day. Absolutely. That is our, our plan is to have an episode two weeks from today that may change. So keep an eye on our on the social media feeds and whatnot, um, just to confirm. Um, but yeah, I, I have a flight at 7.50 p.m. that evening so i'll have to be at the airport uh that evening earlier than i we would normally be able to get me there based on this stream <laughs> and a uh, rainer in the chat is saying that i don't like fun sports i love fun sports i'm just not sure espn shows enough curling i was gonna say taste. like what fun sports like curling or yes. yeah anything that's obscure <laughs> absolutely so, yes, this is a board gaming show and not a discussion of the latest uh, streaming Disney services. Um, as much as I would love to talk about all the latest rides that I rode uh, at Universal and Disney over the past week, we should probably talk about some games we've been playing lately. Crystal, why don't you go first? 
Absolutely. So I've I've actually I got to play quite a few games this weekend. Um, I had friends, a couple friends come over on Saturday night, and then I had a different friend come over on Sunday. So I got to play a bunch of games, uh, some of which were new to me, some of which were not. Um, but before I talk about what I did play, I wanted to mention something that came in the mail, and that is the Wingspan expansion, which Whoa. I am so excited about. I have not had a chance to play it yet. Um, but I am hoping, well, I'm definitely bringing it to my normal meetup tomorrow night, um, and hoping to get it played then, um, because I have to show you all the purple eggs. Look how purple they are. I love them so much. Those are, those are great. I want them. I want yeah, them now. they're delightful. And what's great is there's me and two other people in my game group all choose purple as a player color normally, but in Wingspan, the eggs aren't for players. Everybody can have purple eggs, and it'll be great, so... Uh, haven't played it yet, but expect a report back on this one very soon from me because I love Wingspan. So, so have you tried fitting it in the base box yet? No, I have not. And from what I heard, you can't. Okay. Or it, I, I believe that it's not possible based on the current layout of the box. Although I would not be surprised if one of the third party people does come up with a way to do it. Uh, but I think because of the birdhouse dice tower and the big card like plastic box that's in the base game, mm -hmm. I don't think you'd be able to fit this new card box in there in any way, like unless you just didn't use it. Because um, yeah, well, I don't know if I can pull it out, but you can see underneath here. There's a, a purple card box that's similar to the one in the base game. So there is. Um, and it's it's not tiny, but it takes up almost the size of this box. So, um, yeah. So I'm not... I am a guessing, that from what I've heard, that it will not be able to fit in the base box. Um, and honestly, like, normally that would annoy me, but I love this game so much that I kind of don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So... Something that I did play this weekend, which is technically not new to me, but it's only the second time I've gotten to play it, uh, last year on the Dice Tower cruise, or actually the night before the cruise departed, we had a pre-departure party where people got to play games and hang out um, in advance of the cruise leaving, and one of the games that I played at that party was... Architects of the West Kingdom, ah. which at that point was still very, very new. It had not, I don't even think it had gotten a full release in the States at that point. Um, and I had not played any of the games in this line of games uh, from Renegade at that point. This was my first. Um, and then I acquired it recently and finally got it back to the table this weekend. So Architects of the West Kingdom is published by Renegade Games in uh, technically 2018, but I didn't. I don't think it got wide distribution here in the States until 2019. Um, and it is a worker placement game that is unique because unlike most worker placement games where you start off with usually a smaller number of workers and sometimes have to do things to acquire more workers, in this game you start with all 20 workers that you have and you can place them pretty much anywhere you want. There are a few constraints. The workers are, uh, you can have up to five players, so there's five different player colors. Um, the, they're not the normal meeple shape. They're a little bit skinnier and a little bit, well, I guess maybe the same height. Um, but uh, every player gets a player board and they get 20 of their meeples. And I will try to show you all the board, but it is big and very foldy. <laughs> so <laughs> Very gonna... foldy? Yeah, like there's lots of folds. It's not a like, see, it's six panels. Okay, it's a six panel. So, here. <laughs> I'm in here. <laughs> um, so um, there are lots of spots that you can place your workers. And basically, oh, and it's upside down. I didn't even notice. Whoop. Let's do it the right way up. This is professional. <laughs> Perfect. Uh. Um, you, so you're collecting resources. You're collecting um, people that have special abilities. And you're building buildings that will also give you special abilities. As far as, like, theme goes in this game, we're, we're not talking anything super unique here. But what is unique is you have the ability to capture other people's workers from the board and put them onto your own player board and kind of have them in a little, I like to call it like a sheriff's office, like a little like county jail. And then you can actually gain money by sending them to prison, which the prison is a section of the board itself. Um, so it's a way to get money and also prevent other players from getting all of their workers back. Uh, what's neat though, you can also capture your own workers back off the board um, and put them back into your supply. But why would you want to capture other people's workers, you may ask? That is because 
all of the actions on the board, or the vast majority of them, get stronger the more workers you have on a particular place. So if I go to the lumber yard to get wood, my first worker there gets me one wood. If I put a second worker there on my next turn, I now get two, three, four, so on and so forth. So when somebody sees me collecting four or five wood on a turn, they're going to say, ah, that's not happening, and they're likely to to go round up my people. So there's this weird, like, back and forth of you want to collect more resources, but you don't want to make it look so appealing for other people to capture your, your guys. Um, and you would think that it would feel mean to capture other players' workers, but it really doesn't. And the first time I played this, we played with either four or five people. And this most recent game, I actually played with two. I was very curious to know whether this game would work with two people. And it really does. Um, it allows you to round up Uh, meeples from more than one location if you're playing with two people um, you can round up from two different locations and really the theme kind of generic and boring but the gameplay is so smooth really interesting Um, and my friend and I had very close scores I think I only beat her by six points when we played this weekend Um, she really loved it and I I'm very happy to say that after a second play, I enjoyed it even more than my first. Um, I have not gotten to play Paladins of the West Kingdom yet, which is the kind of sequel to this game, I guess. Um, And I'm very curious to try that one out as well. Um, But for me, Architects of the West Kingdom from Renegade, as far as worker placement games go, is a big win. I love worker placement games in general. It's one of my favorite genres of games uh lately and this one is probably near the top of my list for those i uh, got to play this at the um at the retreat for the first time and and really enjoyed it as well i think the system is very strong and that that um the concept of it's almost a push your luck sort of thing of do you continue to put workers on a particular space and and get that stronger and stronger action. There's some uh, resources that you can only get. I think it's gold that you can only get once you have more than one person on the space. And uh, and so you have to sort of push your luck a little bit in order to get those valuable resources. But that's also a huge red flag, like a flashing light that says, someone come and arrest my people, um, which you then... And then there's this um, this system where if you have the most guys in jail... Uh, you're going oh, yeah. to get some negative points um, when when scoring happens, and and so then you're looking at the table and saying, all right, am I can I let it go for one more turn and leave those guys in jail, or do I need to clear the jail and break my guys out so that I'm no longer getting the big negatives when when we hit scoring? Um, so timing is a really big part of this game. Um, I, uh, I, this was on the prize table at the retreat and I was almost going to get it, but I actually got wingspan instead. So, oh, nice. It's a theme, but I, I enjoyed it as well. I have not played paladins either. I, yeah, no, I really like this one. I think for people who enjoy worker placement as a mechanism, that this is a must try. So I also have a worker placement game to discuss. Uh, this is the game that I was most excited to get at Spiel. Um, this is the one that I, I ran to, and Mandy and Suzanne ran to, and several other people that I recognized were in line as well to pick up Expedition to New Dale. This is from Lookout Games. Where's the, the logo there? A Lookout. Um, this is from Alexander Pfister. It is in the Oh My Goods universe. Have you played Oh My Goods, Crystal? I have not. I know of Oh My Goods, but I haven't played it. Oh My Goods is a small little card game that's a sort of a resource management uh, engine building game. And one of the aspects of of uh, Oh My Goods is this sort of push your luck resource collection. You You draw a bunch of cards until you get two sun symbols. And that is the, the morning. And so you may have one or two cards. You may have eight cards. And that that's the beginning of what you know is available for a particular turn, and you may be able to use those resources to do stuff, to build things, to trigger some of the buildings that you already have in front of you, and you sort of then position your worker to maybe uh, utilize all that stuff. And then there's a second half of the draw. You draw more cards until another two symbols come out, and that could again be a whole bunch of cards. It could be one or two cards. 
And then you're forced to use those resources. And if you don't get what you want, you're, you might be in trouble and have to pay extra or not get anything that turn. It can be sort of nasty. Expedition to New Dale is the board game version of Oh My Goods. Let me reach down for a second and grab some stuff. So you've got your player color with a bunch of... Uh, you've got workers that are, if I can find them, that are numbered... They have one, two, three, and four. You start out with one and two. You can later acquire three and four. Um, and then you've got a bunch of houses that you're going to place on this map. And this map has far fewer. This is not as foldy, Crystal. As not as foldy. Can <laughs> uh, use the, the correct technical terminology, yes. obviously. Um, the reason that it's not as foldy is because uh, for each, this is scenario based. Um, so a particular scenario may use this map. It may also use the C map that is on the other side, or even I think there's a second map in here that I'm just now not able to dig out right now um, with totally different locations on them. But at least in your first game, you've got a map. Everybody's going to start out in Longsdale and they're going to sort of spread out from there and place their houses in locations around the board. Um, you also have your action board and you've got you start out with one i think it's a coal mine in the blue the blue slot here as you get more cards you're going to put them in these slots as well and you can place workers in those slots that say uh i'm going to produce let me look at the blue one here i will produce two of this good if i'm missing one of the workers i need but if I get one more worker than what I need, I will produce three of that good. If I get two more of the workers that I need, I will produce four of that good. And this is all based on this random draw. Kind of like the Oh My Goods thing, but you get this event card at the beginning of a round. That gives some sort of parameter for the round, but also, on the wrong side here, gives you which workers are already on the board. So I already know I have one red, two green, two yellow, but zero blue. And then, so then I, I assign my workers. So I can maybe plan a little bit. Maybe I have the workers I need. Maybe I don't. And I place my, my cylinders all over the place. Um, not only am I placing them on this board, but also on this communal board that everybody can place on. And then we draw from the bag more of those workers and they're in the different colors and so i might i'm going to pull i think four of them and so i've got oh looks like one blue one green one yellow one red and that is in addition to the ones that are pre-printed on the card now i see can i activate the buildings that i put my worker on or did i push my luck a little too hard and not get to produce anything i would then have to discard cards in order to make up the difference that sort of thing I'm also using those communal action spaces to build houses on the board, to buy more workers, to upgrade certain actions. Um, but I like I like this this draw from the bag. It's just a little more even because I know the distribution of the meeples in here. And I know right off the bat that this event card has a certain number of meeples on it. And this is pre-printed and predetermined for the scenario. So I know at least the first half of the draw. This part is even and distributed well. What comes out of the bag? Eh, who knows? It could be all yellows, for all I know. But at least I know this has been spread a little better. Um, and this is not a quick game. Oh My Goods can be played relatively quickly. This one's got a little more meat to it, but I really like it. Um, it's solid, I and I like that, that resource draw. Um, it has a lot of the same engine building. You've got one good that can then transform into another, and you can create this cool chain, and when you manage to get that to work, it feels really satisfying. So, yeah, I'm excited. I'm, I'm hoping this becomes available uh, all over the place very soon. Um, it, was, it was a very popular game in Essen, and it should be, should be available soon. You can pick up Expedition to New Dale. I like it a lot. This is only very tangentially related, but there was a game from Essen last year that I heard is getting distribution in the States in the near future, but I'm curious whether you've heard anything about it or saw it at Essen. Uh, have you heard anything about Cupcake Empire? 
I the name sounds familiar, but I haven't played it. So I played it at BGG Con last year. It had okay. just come out at Essen, and I I swear I heard that it was it's getting being brought to the states. But I really really enjoyed it, and so I'm kind of hoping that's the case. Maybe somebody in the chat will have heard more about that one. But I I feel like I saw it. Cupcake Empire. Um... Oh man, I'm drawing a blank on who the publisher is, but I feel like I did see display tables of it at Essen this year. Um, okay. But that doesn't mean necessarily it's available in the States. Right. Yeah, I feel like I heard it somewhere, but I can't remember where now. So I'll have to look that one up later. Yeah. Uh, Daniel asks, was it worth running for? Um, I think it. I think that that was. I'm glad I brought that one home. Um because it's ha it's been played already, uh, I'm looking forward to playing it more. There are other games that haven't gotten to the table yet, and I'm already thinking maybe I didn't need to run for them. Um, but again, it's been busy the last couple of weeks, and I haven't gotten to play as much as I'd like. But yes, New Dale, I'm glad I ran for. Wonderful. Um, so usually this is something that I say at the end of the episode, but I'm going to try saying it in the middle and see if it makes a difference. Uh, anyone that's watching right now, I know that you all are the best. You're the most wonderful viewers we could ever ask for. Uh, if you are enjoying Dice Tower tonight on a regular basis, if you could click the little thumbs up button below the video, I would really, really, really appreciate it because it helps with the YouTube algorithms. And I normally say this at the end, but sometimes I forget. So now that I've remembered, I'm just asking you to do it now. And I might mention it again at the end, just in case somebody comes in late. But Indeed. Renee uh, mentions an interesting point that I wanted to bring up as well. Also in the Oh My Goods universe is a little game called Tybor the Builder, or Tybor the Baumeister, um, which is also a decent little card game. Uh, not quite the same as Oh My Goods, but also a neat resource management sort of thing and worth checking out. Very cool. All right, well, I think it's time for a Thanksgiving themed trivia game. What do you think, Eric? Uh, well, yes, absolutely. I can't escape now, so um, <laughs> uh, I'm a captive I am audience. doing something unlike anything that we've ever done before, and it is not going to be you against the chat, um, but chat, I'm going to tell you that you all get to keep your own score, and um, if you basically, if you, if you get the correct answer before Eric gets the correct answer out loud, because obviously there is a delay and all of that jazz, right. um, I'm say give yourself a point. So you're looking for a total of five points maximum because there's going to be five. And I'm going to have to share my screen, which means I have to move some stuff around because Skype okay. is being weird like it always is. <laughs> so we're going to... So let me let me set this up for you briefly before I pull up the materials that I'm going to be showing you and start sharing my screen. I came up with a question, and that question was, what would happen if the characters in some of our favorite board games were celebrating Thanksgiving? What would that look like? Okay. What would that mean? <laughs> All and right. most specifically, what would they be texting to each other if, in fact... They were celebrating Thanksgiving. So what you are all about to see is fake text conversations between characters in board games. <laughs> and you are going to have to guess what board game the characters are from. So uh, I think for, the, for one of them, I did put in some real names, but the names themselves have nothing to do with the board game, if that makes sense. But in most of the instances, there's just no names. It's just generic text messages. I am going to start sharing my screen. I don't have an example. I just have the five, but I think you all will kind of get it when I show you the first one. Okay. So I'm going to, let's see, go to the share screen. Yes, that is the screen I want to share. Okay, so Eric, you can let me know when. Um... All right. So, do you need to? Do you need me to see uh, anything other than your screen? I don't believe so. Okay. I don't think I need to be visible at all. So I'm gonna bring uh, your screen up, and I'm gonna take us out. Okay. So now we're just looking at your screen. I'm actually gonna. Ah, eh, we'll leave our little graphics up on the screen as well. Why not? Okay. I like our little uh, cartoon characters. And for the record, chat, I do believe this game is going to be pretty easy. I did not try and make this super difficult, um, but that is because it is a concept I've never tried before, and so I wanted to see if I could even do it. So, <laughs> um, so my screen is good to go. I uh, yeah, you you should be. Okay. So I'm just gonna go ahead and bring up uh, number one. 
and it should take a second hopefully to load and then you all will be able to see uh, what is happening in the text message conversation. I'm not going to I don't I'm not going to read it out loud because that seems unnecessary, but So this um, is all it'll... animated and it's going to play through. Yeah, so <laughs> Okay. So if at any point, Eric, I mean, if you want, you can probably wait till the end, I guess, to guess, but. <laughs> so these are characters in the game? These are, well, if if they were in the world of this game, it, it should, it should, they're not necessarily named characters. They gotcha. are just, this is, a, a board game is being alluded Cherries. to. Well, this could be Hi Ho Cherio, but probably not. Don't add too many. Oh, too. It exploded. Okay. Um, that is the end of the conversation. That's the end of the conversation. That's it. Uh, a, a game where you add too many cherries. I mean, someone some... in the chat already has it. Is it a la carte? It is not. Uh, it exploded. What what kitchen game explodes other than a la carte? <laughs> a couple people in the chat have figured it out. Well, I guess it could be Quacks of Quedlinburg. It is, in fact, Quacks of Quedlinburg. those are called cherry, cherry bombs. Cherry bombs. <laughs> yes, the, the white tokens are called cherry bombs, so... Okay. That is our first one. Good job, chat. I'm glad yeah. you guys got it. I, uh, I, I mean, it doesn't have cherries. It has cherry bombs. But, you know, sure. I couldn't make it too obvious. Right. So we will move on to number two. I have played Quacks, Reiner. I, I, I know. <laughs> okay. I was thinking of inviting him to Thanksgiving. No, 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 no. Is this about... Is this about Vassal? No. He's always so grumpy. Oh, he's been in the agency for a long time. The agency. This is the Men in Black board game. Grumpy. Uh. Oh, oh, you're talking about Bob, aren't you? You're talking about inviting Bob to the... There he is! There he is! <laughs> so this is time stories for sure. <laughs> it's almost over. This is where we're close <laughs> to the end of this one. <laughs> that creepy That's flying end. robot at home. <laughs> so yes, Eric is correct. It is time stories. And a bunch of people in the chat got it as well. So Indeed. give yourself a point if you got it right. All right, moving on to number three. All right. Yo. Okay. <laughs> Fine, boring, okay. The trip. The trip, what games? Out making deliveries. And the passengers behaving themselves. Well, that could be. That could be anything. Barely gave us enough quarters for everyone. Okay, that could be. This could be. Not many ships. The good thrusters. So this is um the 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 one with the drawing and the. Galaxy Trucker. The good thrusters. Yeah, no, no, this is definitely Galaxy Trucker. <laughs> oh, no! Tragedy! Half the ship is just gone. This happens every time. Face palm. So, 
Yes, Eric, you are correct. It is Galaxy Trucker. <laughs> I I had to make some tenuous connections to Thanksgiving for some of these, but I sure. think it, it works, you know. Uh, all right, number four. Oh, I'm having fun. This is great. <laughs> I had a lot of fun writing these, for the record. They're in five minutes. Doors unlocked. Just take a left, then a right, and head down the hallway. Okay. I walked in, but I think I made wrong turn. A lot of weapons. <laughs> um... <laughs> Past the sewing room and through the salon. Castles of Mad King Ludwig? Ding, 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 ding. All right, if you hit the hole, you went too far. <laughs> That's the end of that one. <laughs> no mention of the grotto, though. And I mean, I there's only so many rooms that I can mention without making it way too obvious, but I, I thought the hole was probably notable enough so yes that is castles of mad king ludwig that yep. we were looking for there uh so good job on that one uh, i didn't see any answers in the chat but that might be because you were really quick with that one i was so. they're, they're still um they're still discussing oh. how dark the uh, galaxy trucker turned out oh <laughs> i mean at least the, the the captain was still alive so you know there's that <laughs> oh it could have been um, betrayal of at house on the hill that oh, they said Between been Two Castles has too long of a name for them to type it out. So, yep. well, let's see. For my number five, um, well, yeah, well, oh, I'll have you wait until the end to guess on this one, Eric. Okay. So that way they can they so, can definitely get their guesses. No, in. no guessing. Okay. Yeah. What's everyone bringing for the Thanksgiving potluck? Was that an intentional misspelling at the beginning? Oh no, there's lots of those. You've just missed all of them so okay. far because it actually recorded me typing this stuff. Gotcha. <laughs> Uh, and those are three different people responding to a group chat. In case I, that's all right, not I think I've, I've locked in my guess. Okay. Yep, I've locked it in. I definitely. If you look at the top right, you can see who the blue person is that's chatting at this point <laughs> in the conversation. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> oh, I like it. <laughs> Yep. Okay, so chat ch to the chat is putting their guesses. Eric, what is it? I, it was definitely Sheriff of Nottingham. Yeah, <laughs> it is Sheriff of Nottingham. And yeah, it scrolled by really quickly. I wonder if I can here go back and show you. So Z is the first blue message that pops up. Uh huh. I can make it scroll here. There it goes. So then Sam is the second one. Nice. And then, of course, Tom is the one that's lying about what he's bringing. <laughs> I had to add the in pie form, of course, because just bringing apples to Thanksgiving didn't seem right. Yep. Oh, okay. So that is the end of my All ridiculous right. experiment of if board game text message conversations involved Thanksgiving. Um hopefully you all enjoyed that. Um I did. That was great. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, or do you need to switch stuff over first? I've, I've switched. Uh, you can do whatever you need to do. Okay. Uh, stop sharing. So it should be to me again. Yeah. Or just um, only you. There's nothing but you now. Oh, well, that's so fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, chat, if you all liked that game, let me know. Um, I think that that is something that I could probably do in the future. Obviously, it wouldn't be Thanksgiving themed, but text message conversations from board game characters. Um, I could do that again, if that is something you all like. Obviously, we like to do games that you all enjoy. Um, and we I try not to repeat the same games too frequently. But um, please let me know if that's something you'd like to see again. Um, but yeah, let's head into our main discussion for today. Yes, this was your idea, Crystal, uh, as we're getting closer to the, the Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, this one certainly works for me because uh, it's been a tradition in my family to do a game day right after Thanksgiving. Um, in fact, one of my wife's first encounters with my extended family was at a post-Thanksgiving game day. We just threw her to the sharks. Here you go. Here's the, the family, and, uh, and, and we're all going to play games now. Um, and we wanted to talk about 
what games work well in that situation and, and what games don't always work well when you throw it out in front of the family. Yeah, and I think... So something. So you and Tom on the podcast this week, which if people haven't heard yet, they should definitely go listen to. Um, you mentioned that you kind of have for introductory games this gauge that you use, and that is whether you think your mother-in-law could easily get a hold of the game or like play, learn it, and understand it. Right. Right. I mean, and and the 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 sort of textbook example is that. Ticket to Ride is often thrown out as you know the ultimate gateway game, um, and for her that's too complex. And my gauge for introductory game that works for my mother-in-law is Transamerica. It's got a simpler gameplay, uh, simpler route building, and it also uses the same sequence multiple times like you you know you've got your five cities and you are competing to try and connect all five of them you only have one piece one type of piece that you're placing on the board and as soon as somebody connects their five everybody else determines how close they were to doing the same they get those negative points you reset the board and do it again so as far as grasping everything you you sort of get it uh and if you don't understand it completely on the first go you then get to restart and and do it again, um, and it's it doesn't, which some would consider not great because it feels like you're doing the same thing over and over again. But it for a, an introductory game, it's perfect. Um, and I played this with her, and she had a little trouble the first time understanding what happened. But then once she saw how it played out, she's like, "Oh, okay, now I get it. Well, let's go and do it again. Here we go." Um, and, and she enjoyed it and actually went out and bought a copy, which is pretty cool. That is awesome. And I know that Tom poo-pooed your pick here. And for the record, I have nothing against Ticket to Ride. I think it is great. But I would agree, I like Transamerica, and I do think it is a little bit more approachable. Um, for this list, though, like for me, so I do think there is a lot of crossover between gateway games or introductory games and games that would be good at a holiday gathering. But I don't think that the the two circles are, you know, complete overlap. I think yeah. that there is so, there are some games that are good gateway games that would not be good at a holiday gathering. And I think that there are games that would be good at a holiday gathering that I wouldn't actually use to introduce people to the hobby proper. Yeah, I think you end up with a lot more party style uh, that gets folded into the holiday mix. Uh, we, we see telestrations show up a lot. I've done um, the the video trivia game um, uh, Seen It. Oh, yeah, yeah. Many times. Um, I did mention uh, King of Tokyo as, as a good game for intro, and I think that worked in a family situation. And Roll For It is another great one for introducing and having people jump in and out. Um and, and watch and, and instantly understand that game and know what's going on. But I do feel like you have more more of the the social games, the party style games that are going to get played at a holiday and not necessarily ones that you're intending to get people to dive into the deeper mechanisms. Right. I think I think we as gamers sometimes choose games for introductory purposes that we think will a not just be approachable but will pique people's interest in learning more about board games like something in them we're hoping will spark something but for me when i bring games to a holiday gathering if somebody decides to start digging into board games after the fact that's all well and good but that's not usually what i'm trying to do i'm honestly trying to kind of just entertain the group in some fashion. And since I love playing board games, they tend to be the source of entertainment that I enjoy the most. So yeah, like some party style games, I think are ones that I bring out, but there are other games that I bring out too. Um, my, my mom and my dad both really liked uh, Rumble in the Dungeon, which is a pretty simple game from Yellow. And I don't think I think that, like, it's simple enough that I don't think I would usually use that as an introductory game. It is, it's not bad. I own it. I like it. But it, there isn't a lot there in Rumble in the Dungeon. It's kind of random. There's not a ton of strategy. It's, it's pretty simple. And I don't think it would usually be a game that I would introduce to somebody to try and get them into the hobby proper. It's not to say that it couldn't work for that. But that's not what 
I would use it for. Whereas if we're just sitting around in the living room and everybody's full of turkey, you know, it's an easy enough game to pick up and play. Um, and my, my parents and my family liked that one. So I think it serves different purposes in that way. Yes. Uh, I think quick playtime is important here too, because it's, uh, like after everybody's sitting around having eaten turkey, uh, or, or snacking, getting up and socializing. You don't want something that you're going to be stuck at the table for a significant amount of time. You want something that you can jump in, play around, jump out, um, go get some more turkey <laughs> or, or snacks or, or a drink or whatever. Um, and, and so these these quicker games, chat has gone by with, with really light stuff like Bunko and LCR. Um, oh, which, yeah. I don't know if I, w I would not recommend, but this is the so you want to go maybe one more level beyond that and not too much farther. Liar's Dice is a good one. Oh, um, yeah. You can get through a round of that. I mean, your perennial favorite strike, I think, is perfect for this. I bring it with me yeah. every time, and my sister really loves strike. She's excited when I bring that one out. Which reminds um, me, how's your travel version coming together? I, I haven't done anything with it. So when we started renovating the house in August, all of my board games kind of got moved and shuffled around and put in random places. And anything that isn't a game I'm playing regularly at this point is shoved in a closet or in the loft. And everything is everywhere still. And it has been like three months. And I just, I don't want to talk about it. No, it's fine. <laughs> I just, we've... I mean, we had the renovation stuff and then the water heater blew and then our dog tore her ACL. Uh. And it's just been a very stressful fall and organizing my board game collection has not been at the top of my priority list. And it doesn't help that as I've discussed on this show before, I'm kind of in that mode where I want to cull my collection. So it doesn't make sense for me to organize it if in fact I'm gonna get rid of things, but I've been kind of procrastinating the getting rid of things. <laughs> so it's just sitting around. Hopefully some people in the chat can sympathize. I. I mean, I am a busy person, but I'm also a procrastinator when it comes to tasks that I don't enjoy. And organizing things is one of my least favorite things to do. So yeah. if somebody wants to come over to my house and organize and help me figure out what I want to sell, <laughs> that would be lovely because it's not happening currently. Oh, I, Hoping I hear in the you. near future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, before we leave Strike, uh, I got to play uh, with Dave Luza uh, while I was in Germany. Uh, I, I got to have dinner with Dave and Ilka, and they have built a strike arena out of Lego bricks. What? Which is not only, it, it's not quite an oval, it's, it's more square, but it includes ramps and other obstacles inside the arena. So the dice do more weird bouncy stuff, and I thought that was really cool. That is amazing, and I am I can't believe I didn't know about this already, and if, <laughs> I don't know if Dave watches this show, whether live or later. Well, obviously not live, because it's late there. But, <laughs> like, Dave, if you watch this, have you posted videos and pictures and I just missed it? If not, please, I want to see this. It was the first I'd ever seen of it. But anyway, back to holiday gaming. <laughs> so I actually made a list of five points of consideration that I think for me personally, are things that are kind of rules or guidelines for how I would choose a game to bring to a holiday f gathering with family. Okay. Um, so my quick list is that the game should have few rules and be easy to teach, have a relatively quick playtime, which you already mentioned, potentially allow people to drop in or out of the game entirely. If people are helping cook or preparing things and need to kind of come and go, I think that that can be beneficial, not necessarily required. Mm -hmm. um, not be less enjoyable if it has to be paused. I think that's an important point as well. There's going to be potentially a lot of like hubbub and things going on. And some games, if you pause and come back to them, I think you kind of lose the momentum. And other games are very easy to pause and come back to. And I think that that is also helpful. And then number five, work for people of a variety of ages. I think at holiday gatherings, you often have people young and old. And it is kind of nice to not have to exclude someone. Like if you have a game that's not kid friendly and you've got two kids sitting there, that's not fun. You want to be able to include everybody. So I think having the games be approachable for people of lots of ages is also important. Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, you, I think a great category that has become very prevalent lately and does fit many of these categories is the roll and write 
uh, genre. Although we as gamers tend to be looking for the deeper roll and rights, the fleet, the dice games, uh, and the cartographers. Um, I think backing away from that and going for the straight up roll and rights, rolling dice for points, rolling dice for positioning on a board, um, the the Tetris analogs. Uh, there are several out there, um, bricks and blocks and I don't know several others, but. Um, <laughs> That, that those work really well. Um, have you played Roll Estate, Crystal? No, I haven't. And I really, really want to. I haven't played it yet. So I, Chris actually sent me a copy of it back before it was Roll Estate. Like he sent me one of the early versions of it. And I feel so bad. I never had a chance to print it out and play it. And I really want to buy it from Print and Play Arena and give it a shot now. Um, hang on a second. Uh, okay. You, you talk amongst yourselves. We'll be right back. <laughs> so hi chat this is where we get to talk about eric and say whatever we want and no i <laughs> just oh i'm having a really lovely time tonight i always have a lovely time hanging out with eric and you all here in the chat but tonight just seems especially lovely so i'm gonna i'm gonna chalk that up woo he's got it here it is okay so uh roll estate is from chris michaud uh, also known as moderator chris from flip the table uh, it's available as a download from P and P Arcade, Print and Play Arcade. Um, you you simply buy it. I think it's three dollars. Yeah, three dollars. You, you get the PDF file and you can print out as much as you want. So you get you get the rules and that nice little illustrations there, and and then you get the Print and Play sheets. So Roll Estate is a roll and write game. Uh, it's played. It it is designed to be a combination of Monopoly and Yahtzee. And it, it sort of is is kind to both of those games. Um, you have five dice, and on your turn, you're going to roll them, and you get two re-rolls, just like the classic Yahtzee mechanism. Um, and the you, you've got many of them that are uh, the, the basic pip value. So you've got a, a row for threes, a row for fours, a row for fives, etc. Um, and... When you score those, uh, so if I, I ended up with a good number of fives, I, I want to score fives. I will total up all of those fives, but I can, there's like three spaces for fives. I can place my score in any of those spaces. So if I get three of the fives, that's worth 15. I could put that in the first slot, the second slot, or the third slot. The point is that I have to build eventually in sequence. So if I use the middle slot, the one next to it has to be higher, and the one below it has to be lower. But based on where I place that first flag, that could be easy or difficult. Who knows? Um, and if you're the first to complete one of those rows, you get bonuses. Um, you get bonuses for straights. Um, there's some neat little mechanisms for the railroads for getting the straights. Um, and, and stuff that if you get it faster than your opponents, you will get the points and they will not. Uh, so there's a little bit of a race there, a little bit of push your luck there. Um, I really enjoy that one. And this one is coming out at my next family gathering. Um, and for three dollars... I mean, seriously. I mean, you can't beat that. <laughs> you can't. I mean, you do have to provide your own dice, but who doesn't have five dice sitting around? I honestly would be... I would bet money that everybody in the chat right now owns five dice. <laughs> I'm reasonably certain. Anyway, that's... I mean, the packaging isn't much to sneeze at, but, you know, you can put, you can think, make the box no, as fancy as you want. Yeah, that's really neat. Um, and I think you brought up a, a good point about roll and write games in general. I actually had a couple kind of written down. Uh, Rolling America or Rolling Japan, I think, is a really good introductory roll and write game that's pretty simple. It's you're literally just writing numbers in squares and making sure that the numbers next to that number are either one above or one below or the same number. So it's really, that one's really easy to grasp. And uh, someone in the chat mentioned Quicks. Oh, Kabuki Kid mentioned Quicks, and that's also on my list. Um, and I have both the regular Quicks, which is in a tiny box, so it's easier for travel, and Quicks Deluxe, which is in the bigger box with the big chunky dice, which if I'm not traveling, that's the one that I break out because I love rolling those big chunky dice. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, Farkle is one uh, dice game that, that my folks have enjoyed um, as, as another easy entry, quick to learn, uh, just jump right in sort of game. Um, so yeah, I, I have a few other games that I kind of wrote down as ones that I've used before at these types of events. I think a newer one for me that I'm going to start bringing always is Just One. And you and I obviously love that. We've played it yes. here a lot, but 
just one is it, it works in just about every situation and that is just kind of really neat um another one that i think works well with families is drop it um yes. i think a lot of dexterity games fit into this space, but Drop It specifically looks really cool sitting on a table. So I think it has that, like, even if somebody's like, oh, yeah, no, I don't want to play games, then when they see you playing it, it's one yeah. of those ones that they kind of, you know, start moving over and they're like, hey, uh, what, we, what, what is that thing that you got there? What is that about? It, it always has that <laughs> Plinko feel. Like, I want to drop the discs. I want to do and that. And everybody... Everybody always has those same moments for like, oh yeah, this is perfect. And then you drop it and it goes da -da -da -da. everywhere else but where you thought it was going to. And it, it's just brilliant. I really, really like drop it. Um, uh, I also think the potion is a really good one. And I don't think it gets talked about a lot. Um, it is from the same publisher as Bermuda Pirates Fox Mind Games. Hmm. Um, and it literally comes in a little plastic, like, it looks like a pill bottle and it has little plastic tokens in it. Um, and you're, everybody starts with a set number of tokens in their hand. Um, and then you roll dice and reveal tokens based on what dice got rolled and the first to get rid of all their tokens or get down to a certain amount of tokens will win. So a tabletop is not, is barely necessary because all you're doing is rolling a couple dice every turn, but all the other components are in the player's hands and they're all made of plastic. So there's no risk of like getting damaged by food or drink. Um, so I think that that's really important. And yeah, it just comes in a little bottle. So I, I think that's an underrated one that is really good for casual things like this. Uh, I'm trying to think of um, a couple of the sales style games have worked very well, but wait, there's more. And oh, yeah, snake yeah. oil worked really well with my family. And, uh, you know, the silly games often are, are oh, yeah. easy I to think jump into. And fun employed in. would probably fit in that same space. Yep. Well, uh, Chad has been throwing out a few other uh, examples there, which I think you all have some great ones in there. Dixit, um, Rummy Cube, I, which I played with my grandparents growing up. So I, I have a very soft spot for Rummy Cube in my heart. <laughs> I heard you now. You, your grandparents had a like a custom box, correct? That your sister yes. stole out from under so, you. If so I she. Hear so, so my grandfather was a woodworker. He made a whole bunch of different furniture and other pieces um, when I was growing up. Um, like we had quilt racks and benches and other things that he had made from scratch. And he did, he really liked Rummy Cube. So he made a wooden box to hold all of the pieces. I was under the impression that he just made this because they owned the game. They liked the game. We played it with them. My sister says that he made it for her. <laughs> I don't remember that, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. So <laughs> yes, my sister claimed, when my, when my grandparents passed, she claimed the Rummy Cube box. And I think that that's okay. I own enough board games, but, and at, at least I know that it stayed in the family. And that's kind of more what's important to me is that it didn't, you know, get sold at an auction or a garage sale or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it's a neat thing. I've, um, I'm actually going to Kansas City for Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, so I might see if my sister has it. I don't think it's anything super fancy. I don't think it's like intricately designed or anything like that. But uh, if it's worth taking a picture of and sharing online, I will definitely do that. There you go. I, I wonder if you're, if your memory of it is is more elaborate than than the reality honestly i think i remember it being fairly simple and he made very elaborate pieces but i don't i, I think i don't i can't really picture it because it's been i mean probably 20 years since the last time i saw it if i could really remember correctly um and my memory from 20 years ago not so good so <laughs> Indeed. Uh, a couple others coming into the chat for sale, uh, which I think made our, our list of, uh, of on the podcast of introductory games, but another excellent selection. I think No Thanks kind of fits in the same breath as for sale yep. as well. I think No Thanks is an easy one to teach. Yep. Um, Dixit is is very good. Uh, say Ooh, anything. and somebody mentioned... Somebody mentioned Detective Club. I think that one is definitely also not getting enough buzz. And if you want to introduce uh, social deduction style games to people, I think that's a really good entry point because there's less pressure on the person who has to lie than in most social deduction games. So I really like Detective Club and I think more people should be talking about it. Cool. I haven't played that one. It's, so do you know how it works? Do you know the concept of it at all? I don't. Okay, so in Detective Club, um, all, all of uh, one player has um, dry erase boards, and they choose 
a word and they write that word on all of the boards except for one and pass them out to the players. So everybody knows the word except for one person. Then all of the players in turn order, one at a time, will play two cards from their hand. And the cards are similar to like Dixit or Mysterium, where it's kind of like weird artwork with like abstract, odd creatures and art and nature and things on it. So it's very much like Dixit in that regard. So everybody plays a card, plays one card in turn order, and then you go around again and everybody plays a second card. And everyone that knows the word is trying to play cards that kind of will go with that word in some way. And if you don't know what the word is, you're playing cards from your hand randomly. You have no idea what you're doing. So you're kind of trying to glance at what other people are playing and like use that as a gauge. Then once everyone's played their cards, the word is revealed. You know what the word is at this point. If you didn't know before, you know it now. And everyone has to go around and defend why they chose the cards that they chose. So at this point, the liar has all the information that they need. They're not completely in the dark anymore. They just have to make connections between the random cards that they played and the word itself. So I think it's more approachable than most games that force you to lie. Like in Spyfall... You're, you're just out in the cold the whole time and you right. have no idea what's going on. Yeah. Um, I really, really like Detective Club a lot. Um, and yeah, there were a couple times when I was playing and I was the person who didn't know. And when it got around to me, I was like, clearly I played this because of that. Like, oh, it, it was a cherry and this car is red. So blah, whatever, you know, like you just make a tenuous connection. Yep. And what's funny is just like in Dixit or any of those other games, sometimes you, even if you know the word, you don't have of, like a perfect card to play so other people's connections might seem tenuous at best um i highly recommend it i think it's great <laughs> very cool well uh yeah. we are uh, just about at the end of our show uh if there's anything chat that you would like to ask crystal or myself uh about uh disney or our thanksgiving plans or um, what we've been playing lately, anything, uh, let us know, and uh, and and we'll be happy to uh, to answer some of those questions. I'm trying to see if there's any other uh, really good suggestions that have flown by. Wits and wagers. I don't know if we mentioned uh, showed up in the chat. Which that is... one's great because you can kind of do it the way Tom does it, where it doesn't matter how many people you have, you can team people up right. and still play. Yeah, and, and that's another, you mentioned the drop-in, drop-out concept. That one's an easy one to add or remove players onto teams. You know, what's the big difference if you've got four people or three people on your team? Somebody can go Absolutely. answer the door or check the turkey or, you know, go get a drink, whatever. Um, that also, uh, I mentioned the, um, oh, seen it, the, um, uh, the, the video trivia game playing that in teams can also be a uh um, a, a good fit for drop in drop out uh halo drops some info in the chat for me about cupcake empire it uh sounds like it was intended to be released by asthma day in september i don't know if that has actually happened but uh maybe it has and i just wasn't aware so i really like cupcake empire a lot uh, Rainer asks, do you consider Thor a Disney princess because the new movie will feature Lady Thor and Disney owns Marvel? Sure, why not? Yeah, yeah, my answer would be yes then. I mean, I, I, I mean, honestly, although I'm kind of that like cheesy opinion that like kind of anybody can be a Disney princess if sure. they want to be a Disney princess. Because the definition of princess, it's like even the Disney princesses aren't all princesses. A lot of the early ones... Right. Were. But like, yeah, I don't know. I think princess is a very loose term. And yeah, isn't, haven't they said like technically like Anna and Elsa aren't actually princesses at all? Like they never are, right? Well, they like, never said, th well, no, they call them Princess Elsa and Princess Anna. Do they? Yeah, I believe in Frozen they refer to them as such. And they, they are the rulers of Arendelle. So. I think they're princesses. I feel, like, I feel like as part of like the official Disney princess line, like they obviously they have a ton not, of merch yeah. for them, but they there was somebody that I thought was a princess that I heard wasn't technically like one of the well, official Disney princesses, Leia, but I don't remember. for one. Yeah. The Emperor in the Emperor's New Groove is a Disney princess. <laughs> yeah, David Spade is a Disney princess. <laughs> oh man, Emperor's New Groove is like 
my I think Thomas says the same thing. It's basically like low key my favorite Dis- animated Disney movie. I love it so much. I you know that one's never clicked for me. I think I've only watched it once. Yeah, but it, it never. I was never really into that one. I don't, I, I don't know what it is exactly. Um, the oh gosh, what is his name? The actor who plays Kronk. Uh, he's Putty in Seinfeld. Patrick and he's, Warburton. Patrick Warburton. Yeah, he. Yep. I, I think. He's yeah, a- he's. Hilarious. Yeah. Lemmy Snicket slash the uh, the intro guy on Soren Over the World at Epcot. Oh yeah. He's your guide. He's done a lot of things. He has. <laughs> He's in Skylanders too, the video game. Oh, okay. Oh, so Renee asks, is it Blockus or Blocus? Or Bloku. And I would love to know the answer to this question. I default to Blocus, usually, I think. So I, I'm interested to know why you, th- why Blocus makes sense as opposed to Blockus, because all of the pieces are blocks; they're they're squares. So <laughs> right, but I think because the C is missing from the word, like if you were looked at the word block, B L O C K, and this is B L O K, I think in my brain the word bloke, B L O K E. I'm not saying I'm right at all. I'm not arguing this position. I'm not saying it's correct. I'm just saying that is where my brain goes. <laughs> I mean, if there's anything I've learned from narrating audiobooks over the last decade and a half, it's that names don't make sense. Like, I have gotten into so much trouble think, you know, trying to apply the, the rules of logic and English to someone's name, and it does not does not work because names Well, that's are... because English is a horrific language with <laughs> so many inconsistencies and the goodness bless anybody outside of the U.S. who learns our poor language because it's a mess. <laughs> uh, yes. A uh, question about the cruise. What's the best place to fly into and what hotel is best? I've only been on the cruise once and we're flying, we're, we're departing out of a different place than we did last year, I think, right? Uh, like, it should be the same port. We're still flying out or we're still leaving from Fort Lauderdale or Port Lauderdale. Oh, okay. Um, and yeah, yeah. flying into the Fort Lauderdale airport is the most efficient method of getting there. Um, as far as the hotel, however, I believe it is a different hotel and I don't have that in front of me. I don't either. But honestly, if you look at where the pre-party is, uh, I would assume that there are, even if that hotel doesn't have spots available, that there are other hotels nearby. And since you're only going to be in there for one night, like, I would say that, you know, it's, you're probably safe with looking at reviews online and seeing what has decent reviews and just picking one. Uh, a question about Disney, uh, Galaxy's Edge, this is the new Star Wars land uh, at, at uh, Hollywood Studios and in uh, at Disneyland, which is um, it's California Adventure, I think. It looks fun, but is there enough to do there? It's new, so maybe you should give it time to build up more. Yes, if you have not already made plans to go to Galaxy's Edge, I would wait at least a month or two for the second attraction to open. So there were two big rides that were supposed to be opening, um, originally supposed to be opening right away, and then they said, nope, not not all of them are going to be open. So right now, there's just a Millennium Falcon ride, which is really cool. You you basically enter the Falcon, you hang out in the lounge with that holographic chess set, and then they send you into a room where you do a motion simulator thing, and you have a job. Some of them are pilots, and some of you are gunners, and some of you are engineers, and you fly through this very interactive adventure. There's that that's open now, but the Rise of the Resistance, which is supposed to be this amazing new attraction, is not yet open and is planning to open in December. Maybe. Um, I Man, the wait. holidays are already busy around Disney, so that's going to yeah. be a circus. <laughs> wait for them both to be open and for them to work the bugs out, say, you know, at least midway through next year and and wait for the crowds to die down a little bit. It's, um, so- yeah. We had talked about in advance of your trip that you were kind of curious how your son, who is not keen on Star Wars, was going to take to all of that. So how did that go? Yeah, um, I mean, my elder son is 11, and while he grumbled in a good-natured way, he really didn't resist that much. I mean, he's like, I don't really want to do this thing. Why do we need to do this? I'm like, we're going to do this. It's the brand new ride. We're going to do it. He's like, fine. 
Here we go. And he got on the Falcon and he performed his duty and, you know, he, he did the ride. Um, and he sort of grumbled about it as we're walking through. But you can ignore the theme and just, look, it's like Spaceland. You know, it, it's, it's this cool, um, well-themed world. It had wacky food. One of the restaurants I ate at was really tasty in, uh, in Galaxy's Edge. I had a great salad there. You know, who knew? Um, and so he did fine. Uh, the younger one decided he didn't want to ride anything at Universal. Like, anything. And so we learned about the child swap room next to all of the rides. There is this, like, a little lounge that one parent can wait with the child while the other one rides, and then you swap and stay with the non-riding child. And his brother got to ride everything twice because both his mother and I wanted to ride everything. Um, and so he got to ride. He went went through the line once, got to ride twice, and the younger child didn't ride anything. Um, it worked out. It was just a little frustrating. And I, I think in a year or two, he's going to be very disappointed that he didn't ride as much as he probably could have. I'm sure there were plenty of rides that were too intense for him, but he bailed on some rides that would have been fine. So I'm a little, I'm a little a disappointed. Bummer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Daniel in the chat asks me if I ever did the Star Trek experience when it was in Vegas. And it's funny because I, for the record, I am not, I, while I prefer Star Trek over Star Wars, that does not diminish my love of the Star Wars universe as it is. And I'm very excited about Galaxy's Edge and I'm going to do all of that stuff. But I will admit it makes me a tiny bit sad because Star Trek did this 20 years ago and they did it really well. And as people describe Galaxy's Edge, I'm like, that's what the Star Trek experience was. I only got to go once. So I moved to Las Vegas the summer of 2008 and the Star Trek experience closed at the end of that summer. Uh, I went once by myself. I didn't have any friends in town yet, so I didn't have anybody to go with. And I will say that I was legitimately terrified of the actors who were dressed as Borg. <laughs> it was like, I know you're a man in a suit, but they did an amazing job with the costuming and the ambiance and the rides and just really the experience of it. And what's really neat for those of you who come to Dice Tower West, the hotel where Dice Tower West is located, it has changed ownership a few times in the 11 years since then. Um, but if you look at some of the architectural things in the casino and hotel, you will see bits and pieces of the Star Trek experience yeah. still there. Like the like the uh, entrance to the gift shop and a few other things. You'll be like, that looks weirdly spacey. Yeah. And you won't necessarily know why. And it's yep. because it used to be part of the experience. And I miss it so much. And I have tweeted at CBS multiple times to tell them that they should bring it back. Because Star Trek's getting a beautiful resurgence yeah. right now. There's going to be five new Trek shows. And like, this is the time. Yeah. Or if Alas, not there, I mean, why haven't we seen a, uh, a a theme park? You know, Disney or Universal could pick up this franchise and and run with it and put in all new rides and experiences. And, and I mean, it would it wouldn't be in Vegas, but it would be it would exist, which would be cool. Did you know that? Did you see there's a side room in the hotel um, that? People walked into it at Dice Tower West and started taking pictures and stuff that still has the theming on the on the walls and stuff. Um, it, they use it for like conferences and and things. Oh, it's, no. It's but it still has the stuff on the walls. Um, Bonacore snuck in and started taking pictures. Um, of course he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, uh, yeah, I, I did get to go to the experience. I got to ride both of the rides and I got to hang out a little bit. Um, and it was really, really wonderful. Um, I actually went to a party a couple years ago at a local bar. The Millennium Fandom Bar did a reunion for like the 20th anniversary of when it opened or something like that. Um, and I got to go and I got to talk with a lot of the people who worked there and other things like that. And that was pretty cool. Awesome. Oh, well, everybody's uh, chatting about uh, their favorite theme park rides and how some enjoy the bench ride where you don't ride anything. So I, I sat on the bench <laughs> ride for a while. Um, 
And I also, I've been riding that one more and more the older I yeah. get. And I love amusement park rides. But yeah, occasionally I'm like, yeah, let's let's take a break between the rides. Yeah. I, I will say that the new Hagrid motorbike ride at Universal Studios is really cool. So um, that's that's the roller coaster that has spoilers, right? It is. Yep. And uh, no, I, no spoilers, uh, but it's pretty no, darn no cool. Spoilers. I play. Okay. I did it at night. Uh, so riding through the Forbidden Forest at night is is pretty solid as far as an experience right. goes. I'm 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 thinking about trying to add on days to my Dice Tower Con trip to do the parks again, but <sighs> oh, my poor vacation days at work. I, I just don't have enough of them for all of this it's stuff. Hard. Plus, it's really hot in the parks in the middle of July. Um, it definitely but is. But I, I know I know Mandy did it uh, and, and went on the Hagrid ride, uh, did a day in, in Universal. Um, but yeah, I didn't think we were going to do it. The ride had broken down for a good portion of that day and managed to get on at the very end of the day. Um, but I thought I was going to come home without getting to ride it. Okay. Um, uh, we'll we'll, we'll ask, answer one last question here. William asks if either of us are going to be at the gaming marathon, and we are not. No. I would love so, to. That, um, it's just yes. it's hard oh. to make that journey for one day. I guess it, it's actually two days with the way that the timing works out. But yeah, that would be um, it. Would be fun. I got to participate in one a few years ago, and it was a blast. But it's it's tough to make the trip for one day. Yeah, if I were to fly across the country, participate in a twenty four hour long marathon, even if I wasn't in all of the twenty four hours, it's still. That's a very physically and mentally taxing thing to do. Yeah. Um, not to mention the fact that I really just don't have the time off to take to do it. But I would love to. If I could poof myself to Florida, yes. like if I had, if Star Trek transporters existed, yep. stuff like that would be so much easier. But unfortunately, it's too too difficult for me to do regularly. But we've got the uh, the we've I've got Pax Unplugged coming up here in just yes. a few weeks, and I actually we just announced. Um, uh, moderator Chris from Flip the Table and Flip Flory from Flip Flory's Super Saturday board game serial and I are doing a breakfast meetup uh, at PAX Unplugged. We are, it is not affiliated with PAX in any way, shape, or form. Um, but yeah, we're doing an 8 a.m. breakfast meetup. Um, and if people want to attend that, uh, head over to the Twitter account for my podcast, Board Game Blitz, um, and you can find out the information and how to RSVP for that if you're going to be at PAX Unplugged and want to come to breakfast. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and I know 8 a.m is early but honestly i think breakfast meetups should be a thing even though my brain's gonna think it's five o'clock in the morning at that time <laughs> i i would love to join you i'm not sure uh i don't know what my schedule is yet because uh we've got booth duty and stuff like that and that might it might overlap i'm not sure yeah at some point tom asked if i was coming to pax in like or he asked everybody in the dice tower chat if, I, if they were coming, and I said yes, and I haven't heard anything since, so I'm assuming I have nothing to do for the Dice Tower, so I don't know. We will see. I mean, I'm paying my own way, so. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, uh, chat, before you go, do me one last favor. If you didn't check the little thumbs up button before, please do it now. Um, again, helps with those YouTube algorithms. And honestly, it just makes us happy because we like to see that you all are enjoying the show. And also, I have never asked you to do this before, but I'm going to. If you liked tonight's episode, share it with someone. Post it on your Facebook or your Twitter or your Instagram or text somebody about it. Um, click that little share button below the video and uh, send it over to somebody that you think might enjoy it. Um, we do this uh, uh, show every two weeks on Wednesday evenings, normally at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Our next episode, which will be on November 27th, maybe at a different time. Um, so keep an eye out on social media for that. Um, but yeah, we really appreciate you all joining us. We hope you had a good time with us tonight. Uh, until next time, I'm Crystal Pisano. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been watching Dice Tower tonight. Thanks for watching. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. Crystal and I will see you in two weeks for another installment. Our show is supported by viewers like you. Thanks. Dice Tower Tonight is produced by Crystal and me with assistance from Tom Vassell, Chris Barr, Roy Kennedy, and Rob Searing. Our protests against certain German philosophers provided by Kant Stop. 
Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Give us your feedback on the Dice Tower Guild at Board Game Geek on Facebook or Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network. Find something new at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all of us at the Dice Tower, have, have fun, fun gaming. gaming. So did I tell you I got uh, I got recognized at the Magic Kingdom, Crystal? I, I I don't I think you you might have been told this story on the podcast, but in case people didn't listen to the podcast, you should tell it again. Uh, I, I think I may have mentioned it on Facebook, so not everybody saw this. But I, oh, okay. I was I was in the restroom, uh, <laughs> washing my hands, having done what is necessary in the room, and and there's a guy that notices my shirt. I'm wearing a Dice Tower Cruise shirt, and he's like, "Oh, dude, you you went on the Dice Tower Cruise." And I said, oh, yeah. And he said, oh, man, that sounds really great. I've always wanted to go. I said, well, you, you should go. It's awesome. And he sort of gives me a look. And then he goes, nah. I said, what? And he says, well, do you work with them somehow? <laughs> and I said, well, well, yeah, I actually do work with the podcast. And he's like, holy cow, you're Eric Summerer. Can, <laughs> can I take your picture? And I said, can we leave the bathroom first? <laughs> and... And yes, uh, and and so then my wife and kids are waiting outside the bathroom, and and like they were not prepared for a, an encounter where someone wanted to take my picture. They're like ready to go on the haunted mansion ride, and I'm like, oh no, we we need I, this guy wants to take my picture, and my wife is like, why, <laughs> why would, why? Anyway, like worlds collide. It was it was very strange. Anyway, I think that is a delightful story. <laughs> Bye everybody. Bye. <laughs>